A written book of glitter kind sits on my Kindle behind. All the other things that I should be reading instead. But here we are, so let's all critique this text in this react. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I feel like this entire chapter was a, a mirror pep talk that Anna's having with herself this entire chapter. So that's just kind of the vibe it gives off. And I mean, we'll get into why. However, we do continue on with the lack of citation, even though at the beginning of this book, we were promised scientific evidence for all of the stuff that she was going to tell us in these book in this book about like how to improve our lives and become positive and all that there's no citations whatsoever in this book um and <laughs> as someone who was browbeaten in academia for cite citing your sources uh it kind of wrangles me a little bit that there's so much in here that is just scientists say studies have shown yada 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 just trust me bro there's no citations whatsoever and it really annoys the crap out of me because anna also does this thing where she just speaks from a position of authority and just assumes that people are going to or at least appears to assume that people are going to just take whatever she has to say at face value because it's anna and look, there's nothing wrong with Anna as a person saying something and people trusting Anna wanting to believe what Anna has to say. However, when you preface a book by saying, I'm going to show you scientific data to back up the things that I am going to tell you in the book, you need to actually do that. And one of the ways that you actually do that is cite your sources and explain in depth the actual studies that you're citing which requires you to say maybe not the entire name of the cohort that wrote the paper but there's ways of abbreviating that or that are acceptable and also explain the study not just like a study says cool what was the study actually studying because just because your takeaway from the study is xyz does not mean that's exactly what the study was looking at it could be something that they discovered while they were doing the study but isn't actually the point of the study itself if you hear cat noises in the background i can't help it that aside because there's going to be many a point here where i'm going to be like anna cite your sources so for forewarning for that yeah, so we're so chapter four, self love, acknowledging your worth. She starts off with a quote from Helen Keller uh, Never bend your head, always hold it high, look the world straight in the face. And I think that's a funny quote from Helen Keller. Anna starts off with a story about how in 2012 she took a job at a technology startup um, and then immediately downplays her position there. Uh, she explains to us that if we are not familiar with technology startups, that uh it's very grueling and it's hard work what does she say now for those of you only familiar with technology startups from tv shows and movies it is not the party double polo shirt wearing pop collar lifestyle that is often portrayed i don't know why you would take your basis of reality from television or even youtube but you probably shouldn't do that instead it is long days often sleepless nights and an ever-growing list of demands you can never really keep up with in the beginning, it felt exciting, and the adrenaline, plus lots and lots of caffeine, helped me power through the crazy cocktail of fatigue and pressure. It made me feel powerful. First off, I would expect that any kind of startup would be a lot of hard work. It's it's a startup. I mean, I I don't think I'm in the I don't think I'm in the weird zone by expecting something that you're creating from scratch to be difficult. Does it need to be a Herculean task? Again, I apologize for my cat. He is wound up. So for those of you who can hear him, he's inside a box, inside a box. And inside the box that he is inside of the other box of, he is smacking the folded over lid of it. So he is having a womdinger of a time. We're moving in like a week and a half. So we have lots of boxes and he's very excited about this. Anyway, uh, the other part of this that is interesting to me is not just like her apparent unpreparedness for the level of work that she was going to have to put into a startup, but this concept that she feels powerful. Anna, I think Anna grew up feeling powerless a lot because the 
the the need of hers to feel powerful in all situations at all times seems to be a running theme it's something that she's brought up multiple times in the book here and it's also something that she brings up constantly on her channel especially when she's talking about her workouts and her running it's very important to her that she specifically feels powerful she uses those words and so i find it interesting that this is such a focus for her throughout her life and she says it like i said many times in this book this whole concept of i felt powerful and it just kind of makes me wonder like how powerless did she feel throughout her childhood leading up to her adulthood i just it's just something i've picked up on she says however after about two years i started to crack i mean i think anybody would honestly I was sick all the time. I didn't go out to social events because I was working on the next big assignment or I was sleeping. Sleep was a luxury I could rarely afford. I never had time to see my friends. You kind of already said that. Again, an editor would have been great for this book. <laughs> on the rare occasion that I did go out, I would babble on about my job. My emotions became tied to the success of my projects and the growth of the company. I mean, I can understand this. I really can. This is all very understandable. Uh, a lot of people, when they start new things or they get really wrapped up in a project or they just believe in the product in general, you know, it, it becomes their everything. It's their baby. So it's understandable that they're going to be, you know, wrapped up in it. She does say, I've given up on my, I'd, I'd, I'd had, I had given up on myself in favor of my career. The signs were everywhere. My apartment was in a constant state of disarray. I was never home. So who cared if I had a giant pile of clothes dusted with the bags from takeouts past? My shower schedule was based on when I had meetings, big sit downs with a client. I showered. Otherwise, I lived a life as a greasy, filthy, uh, we're not going to say that. I was the adult version of Pigpin from Charlie Brown, except my dirt cloud wasn't drawn in. It was real. My clothes followed suit. On days we had clients, I dressed well. If I was on days we had clients, I dressed well, as if I was donning some sort of boss lady superhero costume. Otherwise, I wandered into my office in leggings and some sort of variation of a moderately clean T-shirt. I had taken myself completely out of my life. I had stopped taking care of myself and I was headed for a breakdown. Now, I have a few things to say here and I am literally speaking from personal experience. This is depression 101, hands down. If you are going through something that resembles this, um, see, see if there's somebody you can talk to about it. I'm just saying you don't have to live like this. And this is this is depression 101. So. I know it's not something that everybody has access to, but if you do have access to help, now is a good time to go talk to somebody. Doesn't mean it's the end of the damn world. It just means these are the warning signs of depression. Um, especially the, the not showering part, the clutter, not clutter, the trash in the apartment kind of a situation. Um, now, other things that she says that I think are interesting... <clears throat> The, uh, on the days we had clients, I dressed well as if I was donning some sort of boss lady superhero costume. I have often said, and still do say, that makeup is war paint and clothing is armor, especially for women. Men can kind of slide, but in a professional kind of startup, high pressure kind of a situation, you, as a man, you're going to want to, A, be groomed in the style that is fitting to the situation, which doesn't necessarily always mean being clean shaven and, and you know, slicked over, your hair slicked over. And it also doesn't always mean that you're going to be wearing like a three piece suit with, you know, pearl cufflinks. It, it can mean something like a polo and a pair of cargo shorts. It's, it's that kind of a thing, but it's the same way for women, only we are expected to be dressed a certain way at all times like we are expected to have makeup on point we are expected to be in clothes that are fitting for the situation but a step above our male counterparts so it is very much like going into a situation a lot of women find it empowering if not like charging to 
put the makeup on and make sure that the makeup is on point because you are project that it's your face. The first thing people are going to see are your face and then they're going to see your clothes. So you want them to read your face real fast and be like, ah, yes, this, this is a powerful woman. And then look down at your clothes and be like, yes, she dresses well. Don't fuck with this woman. That's, that's how these things come off. And Anna's right here. Like it, it, that is how this works. Like it is a, 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 a costume, if you will. I again, refer to it as like, you know, preparing for battle, um, that kind of a thing. She says, I had stopped taking care of myself and I was headed for a breakdown. Again, this is classic depression. Uh, I encourage you to stop, reflect, and seek assistance if you can. If not, just call your best friend. Um, maybe you've experienced something like this before where you wake up all of a sudden and everything seems to be 100 times more difficult to do. Yeah, it's burnout. I mean, burnout is, is like I said, it's a real thing. Um... She then goes on to say, I thought I was depressed, but the doctor told me the truth. I was exhausted. I, I don't think your doctor's wrong. You, you probably were exhausted, but these, this is also depression. And I, I just, it's, it feels like another one of those points in Anna's life where the people around her failed her. Like, you can be exhausted and depressed. Like, that, that's also that is often a symptom of depression but the way she says it here it's as if she never got the depression part of it addressed so maybe she was focusing on the exhaustion but the depression part never got worked on and this seems to be an ongoing story throughout this book is anna tells us stories from her own words about situations where anyone else would go um maybe you should see a professional for that and anna just kind of waves it off as if it as if it meant nothing and this is another one of those situations she's clearly describing a depressive episode and then it's like but i was just exhausted anna you you need to get help that seems to be like my running chant throughout this book and it doesn't get any better the further along we get i'm just like anna go see somebody i promise you it will get better anyway um so she talks about her exhaustion and then she talks about starting her instagram account and she says i started my instagram account as a way to force a little me time into my life her quotes um some might call it vanity i wouldn't honestly but getting dressed every day became the time I was invested in myself. I honestly don't have any problem with what she says here. I mean, having an Instagram account just to kind of remind you to do something is not necessarily a bad thing. However, this is the origin. This is how she gets started. This is how the Glitter and Lasers brand got going. Anna just needed some time to dress up and then take an outfit of the day and be like, ah, feeling cute today, you know, might delete later kind of a thing, which is fine. I honestly don't have a problem with that. I was investing in myself and exploring my creativity. Fine. I admit at first I felt a teensy bit guilty about my indulgence. Okay. That quickly passed as I began to see that everyone was benefiting. She shifts gears in the middle of this. Like those two sentences is her switching gears. And that's why that last sentence made no sense compared to the top of the paragraph. Um, again, an editor would have been good here. I thought that if I cut back work, I thought if I cut back, work would fall apart. It didn't. By reducing the hours I worked and giving myself some mental space for my job, my work improved. I wasn't exhausted all the time and I could think more clearly when completing tasks. Yes. She then says, research from Stanford University found that after about 50 hours of work, our productive, our pro productive, blah, blah, blah. Research from Stanford University found that after about 50 hours of work, our productivity and output plummets. Look, Anna is correct that there are studies that do show that cutting back on your hours and just chilling the F out basically will improve overall performance. Um, and it is possible that Stanford University did some sort of study that shows that 50 hours of work, a very specific number, by the way, is like the cutoff point. I don't disbelieve that these things are true. There is no citation. 
just saying research from Stanford shows is the same as saying random studies show. You're just throwing Stanford University in here to make it sound a little bit more sciencey. There's no citation here. What was the name of the study? Who led the study? What was, how was the study conducted? Did they actually follow people around in their day-to-day -day life or was it just self-reported? Those are two, th th these are major th points that I need to know. And it wouldn't take more than like a paragraph and not even a long paragraph to tell me all of this information. And it would be a citation. You have the names, you have the time that the study took place, you have the name of the study itself. We know it came out of Stanford. And this is the methodology of the study and the results thereof. It's, it's quick. It takes like a paragraph, maybe two, if you really wanted to be, if you really wanted to like get into the meat of it, you know? This is Anna's book. She has nothing but time in this book. She could have put so much more information in here that would make this read so much more authentically and like make me feel like I'm actually learning something as opposed to just listening to an influencer from YouTube tell me how, how good of a life they have, all the while demonstrating that they don't have that great of a life. You know, it's just also, Cite your damn sources. These scientists and researchers do these things and put their names on these papers and publish these papers because they want you to know who they are. They want, to, they want people to know that they did a thing and they want it to be widely distributed. <laughs> anyway, um, she goes on to talk about basically how she had burned herself out. She was in a rut and she says, don't be like me. And I'm like, no worries. I think an important thing that gets glossed over here because she doesn't talk about it much. And that's probably because in the majority of this, it doesn't matter. But Anna is at this point, uh, Anna is a morbidly obese fashion influencer on the internet. And she always has been. That's how she got her start. She's a fat acceptance, health at every size, morbidly obese fashion influencer. And honestly, there's not a whole lot wrong with that. But going back to her talking about the health issues that she was having and how she was constantly sick and how she was experiencing burnout and all of this stuff. If you factor in the fact that she is morbidly obese, it also kind of that contributes to everything else also. So. And the reason I say this is because there's a lot of studies that link obesity itself with depression and also obesity itself with illness and stuff. Um, the cynical dude himself, if you guys ever want to go check out his channel, he's pulled many papers showing that people who are morbidly obese call out sick more often. They deal with depression less well and other things like that. So... It's interesting to me that Anna doesn't mention in this book whatsoever her size or her fat acceptance or her haze crap until I, I'm, I'm assuming it comes up later, but I won't be terribly surprised if it doesn't come up at all. She's writing this book as if she's just like an average person and she's not. And I think it's a little bit smoke and mirror, but. So later on to round out this particular section of the chapter four, she puts a quote in and she says, to quote Game of Thrones, once you know and own who you are, it can never be used against you. So you can cite sources. So why aren't you? You, you do understand how to cite a quotation. So why aren't you citing any of the studies that you're putting into your papers? Or that you're putting into this book. Now I'm really sus. <laughs> now it doesn't feel like an oopsie doodle. Now it feels intentional. Anyway, uh, we're on to self love is not selfish. Um, she's she does this thing throughout the book where she'll list stuff off. And the way that she does it feels very dismissive as if she thinks very little of the things that she's listing off. 
as mentioned before, when I started to invest more in self care, I felt selfish. Perhaps you too have felt greedy. Maybe you feel like you should instead be investing your time and energy helping inner city kids paint culturally sensitive murals, knitting sweaters for cold grandmas, or rescuing three-legged dogs. The point of this sentence, the point of this paragraph here, is to tell you, the reader, that the things that you feel like you should be investing time in are not more important than, or not as important as you think they are. And then she goes on to write something that's a real thing. They really do have volunteer groups that go out with inner city kids to paint cultural murals throughout the city. Philadelphia is full of them. Um, so being dismissive of that feels wrong to me. It feels very like out of touch to me. She's from Ohio, man. Cincinnati is not Cincinnati is kind of like Philly, honestly. I mean, it's it's got its programs and stuff there to work with inner city kids. Um, this knitting sweaters for cold grandmas. Why is that? <laughs> Why do you feel so flippant about that? And then rescuing three-legged dogs. There's nothing wrong with rescuing animals. <laughs> and in all honesty, if rescuing animals and knitting sweaters are the things you do for self-love, that's okay too. Like, why are we being so condescending to people who want to do stuff for their community as if that itself is not a form of self-love? If you are doing nothing but that and it is making you miserable, then yeah, you need to step back. But if this is how you give back and that makes you feel good, there's nothing wrong with that. That is part of self-love. And I just... The sheer dismissiveness of this entire thing here is just like, I'm always blown away by what Anna does and doesn't find value in. Anna finds a lot of value in herself, but things that occur outside of her very narrow world are, uh, are things that are taking away. You know, it, it takes away from her world to do community projects. It takes away from her world to perform acts of charity. It's weird to me. She says, uh, for some reason, and I really don't have a good explanation as to why, we've been trained to view taking care of our basic and basic mental and physical needs as selfish. Uh, personally, I think that's the puritanical foundations of the United States, but um, that's my personal opinion on the matter. So she's right though. She's right there. Um. She goes on to compare, to use the age old comparison of the human body is a, is a car, is a vehicle. And if you don't take care of your car or vehicle, it won't run when you need it to. Everybody does that. Again, this is another one of those situations where she's basically just parroting and regurgitating stuff from every other self-help book out there. There's nothing new here. Um, so again, though the, the comparison is a good one, it's also one that everyone uses. This, this sentence is also very interesting to me moving forward. I know when I don't take care of myself, I turn into a grotesque prickly monster version of myself and the, and the people around me have to deal with that. No, they don't. They don't have to do squat. The fact that Anna believes that she can turn into this nasty version of herself and be a hateful person towards the people in her life and that they just have to deal with it tells me a lot about how Anna views herself versus other people. My partner doesn't have to put up with my shit. Okay. I appreciate that he does. That's a different statement than my partner has to put up with me when I'm a cranky bitch. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Doesn't anybody on this planet have to deal with me when I'm a cranky whatever? And the same thing for Anna. No one has to deal with you, Anna. The people who stick around and do try to deal with you when you're in one of your moods should tell you more about those people's dedication to you as friends and family, where you clearly don't take the same sort of consideration towards them. I get when you're in a mood, I, you being the global you, I get when you're in a mood, the last thing you're actually thinking about is other people. 
But I have found personally, if I stop and think about other people and how they have to deal with my shit in this moment, that brings me out of it because I'm like, it's not their fault. Nobody here made me this way. I'm having a bad day. It's not the cashier at Wawa's fault. You know, maybe the cashier at Wawa said something that set me off, but that's not the cashier's fault. The cashier has no idea that I'm having a bad day. You know, it's not like they intentionally set off this day and was like, I'm going to make tiny blue anthropologist pissy today and she's going to be in about five, ten minutes and going to buy their coffee and I'm going to say something nasty. That's not how this works. <laughs> that cashier has no idea who I am. Actually, they probably do because I'm in there all the time. But the point being, <laughs> actually, the more they see you, the more likely they are to say something nice. Anyway, I just think it's. I, I feel like it's very telling this whole the people around me have to deal with that. No, they don't. And that's the thing that Anna and Amber and even Foodie need to learn is that nobody has to deal with your shit. The fact that they are says a lot about them. OK, and it also says a lot about you that you view the world as they have to deal with you. OK, so and this is another one of those moments in her book where it becomes very evident to me that Anna wants to be an inspiration above all else to people. And there's this paragraph here where she says, have you ever had lunch with a well-adjusted happy friend and they tell you about some new thing they are doing to find more peace in life? If you're like me, you spend the 30 minutes directly after the meal Googling said thing. If it helps them live a calmer life, maybe it will also help me. This ripple effect is a great example of how practicing self-love habits can help you set a good example to others and help them discover self-love too. So in Anna's world, practicing self-love isn't actually about self-love. It's about projecting that forward so that other people see you as being happy and well-adjusted and they want to do the same thing you're doing because you're setting an example. So this entire thing, again, this goes back to Anna in this book, basically saying, even if you don't feel like smiling, smile anyway, because it'll make the people around you feel better. This is kind of the same thing. Even if you don't feel good, pretend like you feel good because it'll make the people around you feel good and want to be more like you. That's not self-love. <laughs> And it's just these moments that she, it's just the way she chooses to say the things that is more telling than the actual thing that she's trying to tell you. And again, Anna's not saying anything new in this book. And I understand that self-help books, there's probably nothing new to be said. Self-help books at this point are just regurgitating each other, but at least they try to put some kind of spin on it. They try to use, they try to come up with their own little catchy ideas or catchy alternate, um, catchy terminology, that kind of thing. And it doesn't even do that. Like she doesn't even try to call these things new things or anything like that. She's just, she, it feels like she just sat down cut and paste a bunch of stuff out of a bunch of different self-help books and then went through and did a one pass edit to make it all sound like it's something that came out of her mouth. Uh, she then goes on to tell us to feel all the feels. I, it sounds more like she's telling us to wallow, but um, she says emotions are essential to improving our lives and are an important part of self-care is feeling all the feels and then using those emotions to make meaningful improvements to your life. Yes, if that is what you're doing. Yes. If you're feeling too many feels and you can't get the feels to stop, again, this would be a moment in your life where I would say, if you can, find someone to talk to. All right. A lot of times just talking to someone is really all that is necessary. Um, all right. So we move on to how to practice self-love. She basically tells us that uh, how our minds weigh negative information as more valuable than positive information. And this is called a negativity bias. I really need her to back this one up because I don't believe this is correct. And of course, she does not. She just says some researchers believe this was an evolutionary advantage. OK, first off, you just stepped into my wheelhouse here. 
I need better citation. And secondly, I don't believe what you're saying in this paragraph, which is another reason why I desperately need you to cite this. Because without any version of a citation here, it's just like, trust me, bro, I don't trust you. I do know some things about evolution, and I don't believe that this is an evolutionary advantage because I've never heard this before. <laughs> Granted, I haven't been in school for like 30 some odd years at this point, but uh, I do keep up on the literature. <laughs> anyway, whatever the reason, our brain is genetically hardwired to give more thought and attention to a dissenting opinion. I don't think that's correct. And again, there is no citation here. I have a note, I'm checking it. And I just don't believe this is true, but she isn't giving me any information to know where she's pulling this from. Maybe she is pulling it from the most recent and, and most trusted research out there. And if she had cited that, I could be like, man, I don't think this is correct. But then I go check the citation and I'd be like, well, it's the most recent research. You know, I can still feel like it's not correct, but the studies show uh, I can't do that here. There's not even a footnote. There's no way for me to validate this information. So I can literally sit here and go, I don't believe this is true. And that that's it. You know, like, where's your argument against my disbelief here? Trust me, bro. No, I don't. You you tipped a toe into my area here. I don't like this. <laughs> She, she goes on to, um, additionally, our brains are presented with millions of signals a day, too many, actually. Your brain can't process at all. She's not, I don't believe she's wrong here. There have been numbers thrown around that say that our brains are processing more information than they're literally designed to process. But there's no citation here again. So even though I feel like this might be correct because I think I've heard similar things from people who have cited citations, uh, there's no citation here, so I can't 100% I can't agree with her here, all right? Instead, your mind tries to focus only on the task at hand or whatever you're actively thinking or doing. Citation needed. Have you ever pulled out your phone to look at your email or cute picture of, of puppies cuddling with tigers and your friend had to physically startle you to get your attention? I, not in recent memory, but I probably when I was a kid. I don't, I'm sure people have experienced this. Again, this is a great example of what's called sensory gating. Citation needed. You are not an authority on this topic, Anna. You have to cite your sources. Even if you were an authority on this topic, you would be citing your own research if you were saying something definitive like this. So she goes on to talk about our own personal self-perceptions. Uh, if we view negative information as more important and potentially related to our continued survival, these are two different things that she's talking about here. They are, they're not unrelated, but they're not the same thing. Anyway, it's more likely to make it through what our brain filters out. Citation needed. Along the same line, if you're not making a concentrated effort to focus on what you find positive about yourself, you're likely to not think about it. I'm sure we're all, I'm sure you all know what I'm going to say there. In short, if you aren't recognizing why you're the amazing person you are while you are continuing to process all those negative stimuli, it's likely you're struggling to love yourself. Says who? This is a leap. And Anna can put cutesy words in here like why you're the amazing person you are. That's fine. But first off, this starts off as a rah, rah, everybody likes you, go get them, tiger sentence, and then proceeds to talk about negative stimuli and how my brain is working, citation needed, Anna, to it's likely you're struggling to love yourself. Says who? That's called projection. And now we've started off with a pep talk. We moved into unsighted, uh, authoritative speaking, and then we end it with projection. That's, there's a lot that just happened. And that's one sentence. That, that's one sentence. Again, an editor would have been great here. Um, I hear people talk all the time as if self-love is some kind of journey. 
I find this terminology challenging because it implies that loving yourself has a clear trajectory and an import. That is not <laughs> how the concept of a journey is meant here. It's like when people are on a health journey, there is no endpoint. That's the that's the point. A journey begins with a single step. It there's no end. It's just a journey. And it's also like the abstract concept of a journey. But Anna is telling me here that she takes journey as a concrete concept. Then therefore a journey must have a beginning, the point where I say I'm going to start said journey, that first step, and that it must then have an end. So at some point down the road, there is a definitive end point that when I reach that point, I can go, ah, my journey is complete. This is very black and white thinking. Um, and it doesn't lend well to this style of a book. A, the concept of self-help obviously is not a do this one thing and you're, you're good forever. At least I've never taken that away from a self-help book. Maybe some of you have, but the fact that she takes the concept of an abstract journey, the idea that we're calling this these sets of things, these, these practices that we're putting into effect in our lives as ways of improving our mood and our life and our health in general. She takes that word journey to mean that at some point you will be fine. You will be perfect. And that point is a little ways down the road. And it does kind of explain a lot of the things that Anna does, like this running thing in particular. It was all about running the 5K. And that's why when I was watching her 5K uh, video, I was like, so now that she's run the 5K, is she even going to continue to run? Because now she's done the thing that makes her a runner. So is she going to stop running and yet still insist that she's a runner because she walked a 5K? Because it feels like that's what she's going to do. And with this sentence, it really does feel like that's how Anna sees things. So... So for Anna, her journeys do have a hard endpoint. I don't think that's how it's intended in the mainstream self-help anything, honestly. Um, someone once described self-care to me as a muscle. If you work it out daily, it becomes stronger and more reliable. Who? I, I mean, considering the rest of this book where I'm constantly saying cite your sources, this is annoying. Uh, and then she goes on to, as I researched how positive self-perception is manifested in the brain, I found this to be exactly how self-love works. You and what research team, Anna? You are not affiliated with any university or facility that does this style of research. You are not even qualified to do research at this level. So what are you talking about? <laughs> And then she goes on to talk about prefrontal cortexes and processing of positive self-perception -per and how that really is like a muscle and how it really does get bigger. And then she says, mind blown. This is not how research is conducted. You are not the authority here. Ergo, you must cite your sources. It's fine to say, as I was researching, I found papers that said x y and z and this seems to be to me how self-love works scientists and researchers do not typically speak in definitive language it's really really hard to pin a scientist down and get them to say something something 100 percent it just doesn't happen you might get somebody to say 99.99999% of the time, maybe. But we're trained to not talk this way because it's the understanding that whatever research we're putting out at the time could potentially down the road be overturned. We will learn something new next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now we will learn something new about whatever topic that I am currently researching and putting a paper out about. Therefore, speaking in definitive terms like this doesn't age well. Now, I as an individual may believe that 100% of the time, whatever I'm researching is true. 
but I'm not going to put it in writing. Do you see what I'm saying? Also, it's just this arrogant presumption that her Googling shit for a half hour gives her enough authority to speak on this as if she were the primary researcher on an actual project. It's just mind blown kind of a thing. Uh, she goes on to talk about scans in the brain, citation needed, where are you pulling this from? Whose work are you kind of sort of plagiarizing because you're not giving credit where credit is due. You're not talking about the papers that you're pulling this information from. So on top of not being able to back up your statements with credible research, you are basically ripping words out of other people's studies, slapping them in your book and talking as if it's something you yourself did and it's not. And it's, it's basically plagiarism. Um, one of the best ways to build that muscle and give yourself a self-love boost is to express gratitude. According to who? You need to cite your sources. There are studies out there that do show that gratitude practices do help improve mood and do help improve outlook on life. You are not citing a single freaking one of them. They're not hard to find. Living a life full of glitter, a.k.a. positivity, means recognizing the talents, abilities, and support you have been given and acknowledging them in your daily life. This is the first time in this book, we're in chapter four, this is the first time in this book that she's tried to brand the book, Living a Life Full of Glitter. She's trying to put her own spin on positivity, and that's fine, but she should have been doing this in chapter one. You do it in chapter one, you repeat it in every other chapter, especially when you're trying to drive home your points about what is going to help me improve my life, my what is going to help me live a life full of glitter? This is branding. This is why other self-help people do better is because they have some kind of catchy term for it. We all know it's just self-help, but they put their own spin on it and they beat that into your head through the entire book. So by the time you get to the end of the book, you're like, wow, this dude came up with this amazing new concept. They didn't. They just put their own little brand, their own little name brand on it. Okay. It's like the Andrew, Andrew Huberman protocol. There's nothing brand new in Andrew Huberman's protocol. And he'll even tell you that. This is just the shit that he does to improve his day. And he's listed it out for people. And people have gone, ah, oh, Andrew Huberman protocol. I'm going to do the same thing too. Okay. But now Andrew Huberman is the one that came up with the Andrew Huberman protocol. Yeah, but everything in that protocol has been talked about elsewhere. He'll even cite your he'll even cite his sources to tell you where. But since we all just kind of do like the abbreviated stuff, it's the Andrew Huberman protocol. Cool. Again, nothing new under the sun. This is branding. Everybody knows the Andrew Huberman protocol. And if you don't, you can just Google it and you will now know about it. That's how effective that kind of thing is. This should have been started in, in chapter one, paragraph one whatever have you. And again, just repeated over and over again until we get to the end of the book. And I'm like, life full of glitter protocol. I'm going to go do that to improve my life. <laughs> again, an editor would have been great for this. Um, she goes on to tell us how to do this gratitude journaling thing, which again, has been around for eternity at this point <laughs> by telling us to keep a personal gratitude journal. Why not call it uh, a glitter journal or your sparkles journal. I know these are these are like cringy kind of terms, but at least it fits into this concept of a life full of glitter, you know, and somewhere somebody's going to be like a sparkles journal. Oh, my God, that's the exact thing that I've been looking for. You know, my daily journal of light. I've heard people call it that. I've seen that written down places. Anyway, for example, my list might include things like fearlessness when talking to strangers, compassion for animals, and the ability to think on my feet. I get that she's trying to list positive things, but these are not, these are not gratitude statements for starts. Um, and for seconds, this is clearly the way 
Anna wants to see herself. She wants to see herself as fearless in social situations. She wants to see herself as compassionate for anim animals. And she wants to believe that she has the ability to think on her feet. I don't think she isn't any of these things, but this is, this is wish fulfillment. These are affirmations at best. This is not gratitude, you know? Gratitude is things like, uh, I am grateful for the love that my family, <laughs> I am grateful for my partner putting up with my crap when I am not in a great mood. Um, I am grateful that my car that I just bought two days ago actually does work and isn't a lemon, you know, these kind of things. Uh... Resist the urge to list things that are not a direct result of who you are. So, so don't be grateful for things outside of your own personal self. So don't be grateful that your partner puts up with you. Don't be grateful that your car works. Uh, don't be grateful that our credit was good enough to get the loan to buy the car that I desperately needed because my other car broke down suddenly on Friday. Like, we can be grateful for all of this, you know. Um, if you are struggling to list things, try to think about times you were kind to others or yourself that day. Goals you have achieved where you practice good work ethic. Your personality, your responsibility, and any talents. So what she really wants you to do here, what the actual exercise she wants you to do is to focus on yourself. Th that's not gratitude. I don't think there's a there's anything wrong with listing out your positive traits. Like sometimes that kind of a reality check is good for you, whether you are able to list things out or sometimes people are like, I can't think of anything positive about myself. That itself is a statement, you know? That itself tells you something. We're not addressing any of that. That's not where this is going. <laughs> There's no mention of that whatsoever. It's very strange. These are not, this isn't gratitude. This is positive self-thinking. These are affirmations. These are um, positivity statements. All of these things are good things. This is not what she's selling this as. And it's kind of weird that we're in chapter four of the self-help book and Anna doesn't know the difference between gratitude and uh, self-affirmations. <sighs> and then in our second to last paragraph of this chapter, literally starts a sentence off with, studies have shown. What studies, Anna? <laughs> I don't not believe what you've written after that particular phrase about gratitude showing to reduce depression and increase self-esteem because I've heard this statement from other people who have cited sources and studies correctly to the point where I believe and trust what they are saying. That is not how that's done. Studies have shown. What studies? You can literally list the studies at the beginning of the chapter and then at the back of the chapter be like, studies have shown footnote talking about the chap talking about the studies at the beginning of the chapter because that's also another way to set up a citation you tell me about the citation early and that way you can just refer back to it throughout the rest of the chapter and you don't have to repeat yourself every damn time that's fine especially in something written for the public like this studies have shown is not it and we wrap up the chapter with ways to build self-love which just kind of goes back over things that she already said earlier in the chapter self-care isn't selfish feel all the feels and be grateful and and there we end the chapter this entire chapter really felt like a lot of projection and a lot of just we're witnessing anna have give herself a pep talk and we're, we're listening to her stand in front of the mirror and going gosh darn it people like you you're good enough you're smart enough get on out there tiger and, and that's that's what we've what we have witnessed throughout this entire chapter. Plus, we get a story about how she was part of her tech startup 
and how she ran herself into the ground. That's actually one of the, that's the first story in this book that she shared with us where I'm like, yeah, I can totally relate with that. Like, and it doesn't tell us anything particularly negative about Anna's past or pan or Anna's like thought processes. I would think the majority of people who were in a startup like that and who were excited about a startup, I would imagine a lot of people do that and just burn themselves out. I, I can see that being very universal. Um, so that's one of the few, that is literally the first story that she's told in this book that wasn't super revealing about parts of Anna's life and history that she keeps very closely guarded. Okay. Anyway. So that's chapter four. I warned you at the beginning that I was going to say citation needed a lot. So if you're playing a drinking game, um, I hope you made it to the end of the video. <laughs> I hope you're all here with me still. So if you've made it this far in the video, go ahead and put a car emoji down in the comment section because I talked about my car way too much. And yeah, let me know what you guys think. I don't know. Tell me about how you practice self-love. Tell me about things that you feel grateful for. Let me know if you think I'm off base. It's fine. Um, that kind of a thing. I'm interested in what other people think about what Anna has to say in this book. If you're reading the book, I know there's a couple of people who did pick this up. I think a couple of you picked it up on audio and I think a couple of you said you had a copy of it. If you also are reading it, go ahead and let me think. Go ahead and let me know what your thoughts were when you got to chapter four of Glitter and Laser's book. I'm not going to sit here and be like, don't read Anna's book. I mean, it's Anna's book. Anna wrote a book. Anna published a book. That's more than a lot of people do in their lifetime. So as much as I'm taking it apart, it exists, you know? So it's kind of like her 5K. Anna, Anna walked a 5K. Again, that's more than a lot of people do. So I'll give her that. I'm not going to call it running because it wasn't running. But she did complete a 5K. So in the same vein, she did complete a book. I'm not going to tell you not to go read it. I It exists. If you're into this kind of stuff, definitely go read it. If you want to read along with these videos, definitely go do that. Let me know what you guys think when you get to the various chapters. And again, don't forget that your emoji is a car because it, nothing else. The car doesn't relate to anything else in this chapter. And I will see everybody in chapter five. Bye. This is my outro music. You can't copyright strike me because it's just me singing. This is my outro music. Thank you for watching. See you next time.